Hey everyone, this is Nick, and it's clearly time I learned how to iron my shirts. But it's also clearly time we talked about what happened in the past week in the Linux and open source world. This time we have Elon Musk buying Twitter and announcing that he wants to open source Twitter's algorithm. We've got PopOS 22.04 landing hot on the heels of Jammy Jellyfish, and we have the Ubuntu founder, Mark Shuttleworth, who is explaining why Ubuntu won't support Flatpak for the moment or ever. What I support though is today's sponsor, which is going to let you get $100 off your own Linux or gaming server. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video. Linode is the best choice to deploy your own Linux or gaming server. Getting started is extremely easy thanks to their app marketplace. You can just pick from one of the many, many apps they offer, select a few configuration options, and just one click deploy that server. It's super simple. It works for a development environment, but also for a Minecraft or Valheim server. Among the most notable apps, Linode has Moodle to create your own learning management system and teach and sell courses in minutes, but they also have stuff like Pi-hole to block ads. Even though Linus said it's piracy. From Focalboard, a Trello alternative to Rocket Chat, which is the equivalent to Slack or Teams, Linode has everything you would want. Click the link in the description to get your $100 credits and get started. Okay, so Elon Musk acquired Twitter, as you might have heard somewhere, maybe. But that's not the point. In this acquisition, one of the main points was to make the Twitter algorithm open source, which is the thing that interests me here. Musk said that he wants to increase trust, defeat spam bots, and generally make the whole thing more legible, so people can know why they see specific things and why others are not displayed. Other concerns of his were to turn Twitter into a free speech haven, authenticate all humans, and add new features, the most prominent of which should be the long-awaited edit button. We'll have to wait and see if the acquisition goes through and how truly open source the algorithm will be though. Okay, I'm not going to go into more details here, this is a controversial topic for some reason, but I made my own positions pretty clear on Twitter. I think Elon Musk mistakes moderation for censorship, I think he's a narcissistic, immature troll, but I can't fault him for wanting to open source an algorithm that dictates what people see or don't see. His other propositions though, well, we'll see how they go. In my recent review of Ubuntu 22.04, I highlighted the move to Wayland by default, including for systems using the proprietary NVIDIA drivers. Turns out Ubuntu did a U-turn and decided not to use Wayland for NVIDIA drivers after all. It seems like there was a last minute bug that rendered an incorrect frame, which materialized as a doubling of moving objects or some high frequency judders. The GNOME Display Manager used by Ubuntu got an update to default to x.org on NVIDIA systems, although people who really want to can still switch to a Wayland section even with these proprietary drivers. Anything based on AMD or Intel will still default to Wayland though. And that's too bad, I was really excited for this move to Wayland for all GPUs. Now I'll have to wait and see if Fedora 36 keeps the default on Wayland for NVIDIA proprietary drivers or if they revert that move as well. Mark Shuttleworth, the founder of Ubuntu, explained why Flatpak won't be supported on Ubuntu anytime soon or at all. He says that Flatpak wouldn't work for them because he thinks they are not as secure as Snaps and that they don't have the same ability to deliver integrity of execution over time. He says they can deliver a far better experience to developers and to users with Snaps and he feels like there's an enormous number of apps available in that format already, which seems to indicate that developers like the experience and that consumers enjoy the simplicity. He also acknowledges issues like startup performance and managing security for when you want your app to get out of the sandbox. I can say I agree with him on this one. Clearly, everything on the internet points out to the community favoring older packages, app images, and flat packs over snaps, and while they might have a ton of applications, a lot of them are also commercial, proprietary, or Electron-based, while the native open source ones are mostly on Flatpak. And also, that comment on Flatpak security kinda needs a citation to work. Another week with a bunch of updates for GNOME applications. GNOME Sushi, the quick look equivalent for GNOME, is now looking for a new maintainer, which I hope it can find, because it's an amazing application. 
Libadvita now has entry rows to let users enter text with the same gusto as all other Libadvita widgets. Pika Backup can detect settings from existing backups so you don't have to recreate these every time, and performance has been improved. Authenticator is now ported to GDK4. It can use the camera portal to scan QR codes, and it has a GNOME shell search provider. Pods, the Podman client, now has a manual dark mode, lets you rename containers, and has better indicators for CPU and memory status for your containers. Amberall, the new audio player, also displays the current position in the waveform. It has an adaptive UI layout, and it lets you edit the playlist. I really hope Gnome Sushi can enroll somebody new as a maintainer, because it would be fishy if it became orphaned. I also had a rice pun, but I forgot about it. Plasma Mobile keeps getting better with the release of Plasma Mobile Gear 22.04, the compilation of apps for that mobile environment. The task switcher now lets you sort tasks by when they're opened rather than alphabetically. Quick settings can now be reordered, and there is now support for third-party home screens. The media player can control multiple streams, so you can control simultaneous playback from multiple applications. The Mastodon client, called Tokodon, got a lot of improvements, including for the desktop interface. Calendar is no part of the compilation. There's a new Nextcloud Talk app in alpha, and a lot of bugs were also fixed. It's been a while since I took my Pine phone out of its drawer, so maybe it's time to revisit all these mobile environments. I think it might have been a year since I looked at them. Or maybe it's time to ask the Pine64 if they have an extra Pine phone Pro to send me. Maybe. KD developers aren't just focused on mobile though, as we have another round of weekly updates. Applying a global theme will now tell you everything it's going to change, from the layout to the splash screen, and it lets you uncheck certain parts of it, so it's only going to change what you want. That's pretty useful to not destroy your carefully crafted plasma layout. Accent colors can now also be used to tint all other colors, so your desktop looks super coherent. Firelight, the disk space usage analyzer, now has a new homepage. Discover can show all categories in the sidebar instead of nesting them. Kirigami apps can now use a standard loading component to display while the app is searching for what to display. And there were a ton of bugs and smaller UI improvements all around. And the list of 15 minute bugs, which are bugs that people can encounter in their first 15 minutes of using Plasma, has been decreased by three, but also increased by two new bugs. So no big changes here. All in all, it's still good updates that should land in Plasma 5.25. Speaking of which, it should release at the beginning of June. And there's a new headline feature that should please people who like to customize their desktop, which should be most KD users, I guess. Plasma will support an auto-accent color based on the wallpaper's main color, just like what Android does with its Material U interface. So every time you change your wallpaper, your desktop will reflect that change. That's something that already exists on elementary OS, but was not included in the latest Ubuntu release 22.04, even though it did get accent colors. Of course, that's optional, so you can still keep a specific color if you prefer that. I'm not a fan of the Android implementation, I find its colors too muted and too pale, but we'll see if KDE does it better. After the release of Ubuntu 22.04, there's PopOS 22.04, the distribution made by System76 and that they ship on all their devices. Apart from the whole new internals, PopOS now lets you apply automatic updates and lets you configure notifications to be alerted when new stuff is available. There's a new support panel in the system settings to let you access documentation, the community support chat, as well as professional support if you're on System76 hardware. It supports dark and light backgrounds, it has an improved scheduler for better performance, and the pop shop is now more responsive, displays NVIDIA drivers, and generally catches up to the elementary OS app center, which it's based on. Pipewire is also the default for audio. Finally, the workspaces view now has better multi-monitor support, increased performance, and the layout is fixed on high DPI displays. They also say that the new Cosmic desktop environment is progressing nicely, with new designs being tests and new elements starting to be packaged in the new Rust codebase. As always, it's a pretty solid release for that distro, and I'll admit I'm tempted to install it on my main PC every time they have something new. 
There's a new progress report on the MAUI framework, which you might have heard about through the relatively recent MAUI shell release. Among other changes, the file manager index got a nice UI decluttering and an optional action bar with quick actions. The wave music player now supports the adaptive color scheme and has quick search. Other apps also received UI improvements and updates to use the latest controls available from the MAUI kit framework, including the Nota text editor, the Pix image viewer and editor, Communicator, the contact manager, and Station, the terminal emulator. And hot damn, these apps look incredible! I should definitely save a slot in the month to come to talk about MAUI Shell and the MAUI apps. They look super good! Tuxedo announced a refresh to their Stellaris 15 laptop. It's still made out of old black matte aluminium, but this time it comes with an RTX 3080, a choice between a Core i7 11800H or a Ryzen 9 5900HX, and it still brings the incredible Opto mechanical keyboard that I loved in my initial review. It has a 93 watt hour battery and a 1440p 165Hz 15 inch display. The IO selection is still pretty large with Thunderbolt 4 on Intel CPUs, 3 USB Type A, a full size SD card reader, an Ethernet port, an HDMI port, and audio jacks for a mic or some headphones. It starts at 2115 euros with only 8 gigabytes of RAM and 250 gigabytes of SSD. So you'll probably have to pay a bit more to get a more acceptable system with at least 16 gigabytes of RAM. It can also ship with Ubuntu 22.04. I reviewed the previous model on the channel, so if you're interested, you can check that video in the card up top or you can subscribe because I should receive a review unit for the new model pretty soon. So yeah, subscribe if you're interested to see that. Do you like Halo? Do you wish it ran better on Linux? Well, there's good news if you're on AMD. A developer is working on the RADV AMD GPU driver to help Halo Infinite run better, or at all, on Linux. Turns out Halo uses DirectX 12 in specific, non-trivial ways, and that VKD3D, the library that maps DirectX 12 calls to Vulkan, has a hard time interpreting. The whole Vulkan specification might need some tweaks to get this to work, but basically the developer wants to send more work to the GPU through Vulkan extensions. This won't happen overnight, since this new implementation seems to be causing GPU hangs for now, and upstreaming this work into the driver might need a lot more testing. But it's still pretty cool to see people who are so invested to make things work well. I still can't believe that we have so many games that were never designed for Linux and that we can run from Steam or other platforms. It, it still feels like magic to me, honestly. The Steam Deck got a brand new update, probably the biggest it got since it launched. This time we get a lock screen with the ability to set a passcode that you can enter with the touchscreen or the controls. And that lock screen will also apply to switching to desktop mode. So you can now use your deck as a laptop of sorts and not fear anyone stealing it and being able to access everything. The achievements page for games has also been redesigned. It now has localized keyboards in 21 languages and it can switch between multiple windows, which means that games using launchers won't start flickering like crazy when the launcher stays open in the background. You'll also get a warning when your charger is too slow and you can force games to use 2x2 two two variable rate shading to save power. Massive update here that I promptly installed on the Steam Deck that Valve generously donated to me for free. Being a YouTuber does have its perks, it's not just anxiety and horrible insulting comments all the time. And there's always more wine in these videos, and as a Frenchman I'm always happy to see that. Wine 7.7 .7 was released with more X11 and OSS drivers converted to the PE executable format. There's also added theming support for the control panel applets, so things should look a bit better with the new themes Wine ships. And there are 11 bugs fixed, including for Irfan View, Steam, ConMU, and Anno 1602. As always, small incremental changes, but Wine does so much already, I can't be mad at it. Gotta love some Wine. Just like you gotta love today's sponsor, Slimbook. Slimbook makes Linux laptops and desktops. They are based in Valencia, Spain, but they ship worldwide and they have a whole range of keyboard layouts. They make devices for virtually every price point and every need from the smallest form factor PCs equivalent to Raspberry Pis 
to the biggest gaming towers or gaming laptops like the Slimbook Titan or the Slimbook Chimera, which is the desktop I use every day. I'm sure that if you click on the link in the description below, you will definitely find something that suits your needs at a reasonable price. So head over there, click it and start enjoying your new device with Linux out of the box. Now, thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to throw a comment at your screen. And if you didn't like the video, you can also dislike it and tell me why in the comments. Probably something to do with Elon Musk or something. And if you didn't dislike it and you even loved it and you want to help me make more of these videos, you can join my Patreon subscribers or my YouTube members. Both get access to a weekly Patreon cast on Mondays and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. So thanks everyone for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!